<laughs> I do not follow kindergarten teachers. And you never follow a school board member who has just read the world is flat. <laughs> this presentation is called, this isn't what it was going to be about yesterday. I always wanted to call a presentation, this isn't what it was going to be about yesterday. This is something I've just been putting together over the last few hours, uh, mostly just some ideas thrown together that, that come out of this conference, which quite frankly has haunted me. And I've, had, I've been to a number of conferences. I go to conferences all the time, but there, there's a small handful of conferences that haunt me. That, that from what I see, from what people are saying, from mostly from conversations that I have with people out in the hall, you know, I find myself waking up uh, at night with these conversations, uh, uh, you know, bouncing around and ideas, and, and it's, it's, it's just uh, haunting to me. And, and I want to start out, I mean, since we're talking about haunting, I want to go back in time a, a, a little bit. I mean, you know, these, uh, these children, these uh, uh, youngsters are up here, they're performing on a, a, a flat surface, uh, essentially. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing piece of magic, especially, you know, as old as I am. When I was a, a freshman in high school, I had a civics teacher who was, uh, she was a visionary, she was a futurist. I didn't know it, she was a futurist. Because I remember the day that she predicted to us, this is 1967, I remember the day that she predicted to us that by the year 2000, we would all have our own computers. And she said it would fit in your shirt pocket. And she said that thing would be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't believe it. That's outrageous. You know, and of course they had they had handheld calculators before I graduated from uh, from college, and uh, I mean they cost four hundred fifty dollars. But uh, you know th this is this is the rate of change. I mean, uh, here's here's some data that I pulled off the internet the other day. I blocked about this. If you want to get all the background on it, uh, read my blog. But this is uh, you know this is twenty years later. This is 1986. I'm now director of technology for a rural school district in northern North Carolina. And, uh, and of all of the processing power in the world, uh, you know, at, at 1967, it's all in mainframe computers, or whatever they called them back then. You know, suddenly, 20 years later, 41% of the world's processing power, computer processing power, is in pocket calculators. Amazing thing at that time. Uh, personal computers, 33%. Video games, a good bit. And then back to the servers and the mainframe, 17%. It's kind of dropping back. Now, we jump forward to 2007. 2007 personal computers uh, 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 comprise 60, full 66 percent of the information uh, of the processing power. Video games were up to 25 percent. Servers were way down to 3 percent. Uh, and then we got phone and PDAs, which is a, is a bit of a surprise that it's still that small, but it's encroaching up. Now we jump forward to 2021, and this is my speculation. That you know, personal computers are down. Video games are still pretty strong. Uh, phones are probably a little bit stronger. This part right here, I don't know. I mean, I, that, that's that's sort of the question that we always got kind of in the back of our mind. What's going to be the next big thing? You know, what's going to be huge ten years from now? Uh, it's an important question. I think it's a it might be an interesting question to pose to students. You know, where is all this going? What what do you want? Uh, ten years from now, to to uh, be in your pocket as far as uh, something to process information with, to do your thing with. What do you want uh, that you might be wearing on your wrist, or it might even be embedded in your brain? I don't know. What do you think? Where do you want that to go? Um, technology, when I was a freshman in high school, was was this shop class. Uh, the very small high school that I attended, we had electives. If you were in the band, you took band. If you weren't in the band, you took industrial arts. I took industrial arts. Best teacher I ever had, Bill Edwards. Bill Edwards was the first African-American uh, teacher to uh, come into uh, uh, predominantly white schools in, in the town that I grew up in. Uh, he was an amazing man, uh, a passionate and dynamic man. And a good indication of that is that he was elected uh, mayor of that town 10 years later. Uh, but he taught industrial arts in an interesting way. He's the best teacher I ever had. He taught me what facilitating education was about because he, bought, he, he taught us industrial arts by helping us build something. I built a kayak. Uh, some of the students built uh, chess boards. They built stools. They built gun racks. I don't think they're allowed to build gun racks anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, three kids built a life-size replica of an Apollo spacecraft. 
And for one of the Apollo missions, they, they camped out in this Apollo spacecraft and they, you know, they hollered out things that were going on with them. You know, but he helped us build, he helped us learn these skills by helping us build something. Uh, he didn't really teach us, he helped us learn to ask questions. He helped us learn to make decisions. Uh, if he had been teaching us industrial art skills in the same way that my information arts teachers were teaching me, he would have simply put a stack of lumber on my desk and said, here, practice driving nails. Or a stack of sheet metal on my desk and said, here, here, practice grabbing sheet metal. He taught me industrial arts skills in the industrial age by helping me build something. And I think in the information age, we should be learning uh, and teaching information arts skills in very much the same way, by using it as a tool, by using it as something to, to build something with. Um, with things advancing as rapidly as they are, uh, we as educators have to learn. I shared with you yesterday something that I just learned. Uh, uh, today, uh, this morning, I learned that Google now has a new service. I, I don't understand it completely, but it's a, basically a personal data service where you can upload data and then you can graph that data in a variety of ways. It's a Google data, um, uh, personal information, it'll be on my blog. Uh, but, but it's something that I've learned, and I think this is very, very important that we're constantly learning something. Uh, again, I get to go to these conferences, and again, I go in and I see presentations that, that uh, especially classroom teachers are presenting, and I'm bowled over at the innovation, the creativeness that I see. And I go up after the presentation, and I ask, where did you learn how to do that? And not once has one of those teachers said, I learned how to do that in a workshop. You know, I learned how to do this. I thought about this. This idea came to me as a result of the conversations that I'm having with people online. You know, it's the teacher uh, who I share share these uh, passions with here at the school, but it's also the teacher in California, you know, who, whose blog I'm reading. I'm engaging in conversations, and, and the four international teachers in Hong Kong that I uh, that I follow on Twitter. You know, it's this everyday conversation that I'm having with people. This is where I learn new ideas. This is where I learn new opportunities is by engaging in these conversations. It happened to me in 2004. Well, before I tell you about 2004, here's what it looks like. Here's, here's how I like to talk about it. I wrote a blog entry a while back about textbooks of the future. And I was actually putting fun at how, how we use textbooks. But I write about this every once in a while because I, I think it's one of the most interesting questions in education is, is uh, what are textbooks going to look like, or whatever we call them, when they're fully digital, networked, and, and chock full of abundant information? Uh, I wrote this blog, and two people commented on it, and people said, you yeah, know, this is fantastic, this is where we need to go. I mean, if we had digital textbooks, we could put video in those textbooks, we could put audio, we could put animation in those textbooks, and that's absolutely right, and that is a very powerful thing, but in a way, isn't that kind of a fast food approach to learning? Fast food approach to teaching. I want to learn how to do something, show me a video. Okay, I want to learn how to do something, let me put my headphones on and somebody can talk to me. Sort of, sort of a fast food approach. And that's not bad. That's not bad. There's nothing wrong with fast food in moderation. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, driving to a workshop somewhere, I've got three hours to go, I'm getting hungry, I'm happy. Whitney's is up there on the hill, hold the fries. You know, I'm glad it's there. I get to my hotel room at 8.30 uh, in the evening, I haven't had anything to eat since, uh, since breakfast. Papa John's, pizza. It's, it's just a phone call away, bring it right up to the door. It solves a problem for me. It's not a bad thing. When I grew up, we didn't have fast food. This was before McDonald's and Hardee's and, and all the fast food, the Domino's. We didn't have fast food when I was growing up. We got our food from here. You know, you, you walk down the aisles of the grocery store and the food was laid out in, in alphabetical order or some mysterious uh, sequencing that I didn't understand at the time. But, but you know, you, you, you walk down this aisle, you get this kind of food. You walk down that aisle, you get this kind of food. You walk down this aisle, you get this kind of food or whatever. And, and, and mom would take this home and she would cook it. Um, didn't particularly like vegetables. Where I grew up, it was a very small town, three stoplights, and now up to five. <laughs> very small town, but I was a town. I lived in town, so I was a town. I don't know if y'all will identify with this, but there's a distinction between people who live in town and people who live out in the country. When they come to school, you can tell they live out in the country because they wore blue jeans and flannel shirts. You could also tell something about the fact that they had a garden in their yard. If there's a garden in your yard, then that meant that one or both of your parents grew up on the farm. So we never had a garden in our yard. Don't want a garden in your yard. 
I married a woman years later from Charlotte, North Carolina, the epitome of sophisticated living in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> Both of her parents were that grew up on a farm. So they always had a garden. And so we get married, and almost immediately she says, we need a garden. Uh, we need a garden. Uh-uh. need a garden. I don't like vegetables. It all tastes like you never can. We need a garden. Uh-uh. What would the, what would the neighbors think? <laughs> well, one afternoon, spring afternoon, she took me out in the backyard. She held my hand. And we walked over here about 20 steps. We walked over here about 20 steps. And 20 more over here. And 20 more back to the beginning. And she dropped my hand. She said, you know, if we had a garden in that spot right there, you'd have, you never had to mow that grass again. <laughs> and I was sold. I was sold. We had a garden. We decided to go with organic garden. Organic garden. And it was fascinating. Because as I was reading and learning and starting and, and, and learning how things work, what I came to realize was that, that this garden, in a sense, is like, an, like a, an ecosystem. And that gardening is an act of, of learning that this is an ecosystem and how it works. And how you can plant certain plants next to each other, uh, companion planting, and they'll, they'll protect each other. And how certain kinds of plants will take nitrogen out of the soil, and other plants will put nitrogen back into the soil. That it's coming to understand the ecosystem of this space right here and working that ecosystem in order to produce the crops that I need for the for the kitchen to, uh, for the kitchen. And it in a sense learning today very much the same way that, that the information environment that we live in behaves in predictable ways, in ways that it's almost like an info system. And that, that we can learn to work that info system, that information ecosystem in ways that generate knowledge that we need. For me, for me, well, that's one of our gardens. That's my daughter. Not fertilizing the garden. <laughs> for me, it started in 2004. I mean, when I first started it's sort of thinking about this, this experience of, of self-learning, uh, gardener's approach to learning, uh, we might call it. Uh, 2004, December, I came upon one of those times. Uh, as consultants often do, I realized I'd been spending too much time talking and not enough time listening. And a consultant could talk himself into obsolescence. So I decided I need to start listening. And I decided that December I would start reading some blogs. Now I had been blogging for a number of years, or a year. But I didn't know what blogging was. I thought that blogging was about me as a respected authority, uh, sharing my ideas with my, my audience out there, all seven of them. <laughs> but I decided to start reading blogs. And I started out with these two guys right here. This is uh, Andy Carvin, who has a blog called A Waste of Bandwidth, and this is uh, Will Richardson, whose blog is called Weblog Ed. How many of you read Will, or, or either of these? Uh, Will's probably the preeminent K-12 blogger out there. He's uh, been blogging longer than any other educator I know. But I learned very quickly what blogging was. That blogging was not an authority speaking out of their hook on heads, that, that blogging is, is writing out of the heads of other bloggers. That, that many of their articles began with, this person over here said this in their blog this morning, and this is what I think about it. And then somebody else taking, taking my blog and then commenting on it, writing something and adding to it. That it's really a continuation of a conversation. And as a result, you know, I read one of, uh, uh, one of Andy's blogs, and he mentions this guy right here, that Weinberger is actually a philosopher. And from what, from what uh, Andy said about what David said, I leaned over and I read a few of, uh, of uh, David's articles and I realized, here's somebody else I need to be following. And then, then Will Richardson wrote something about this guy, Lawrence Lesser, who's a law professor at Harvard University. From what Will said about him, I leaned over, I scanned a few of his articles, here's somebody else I need to be paying attention to. Here's somebody else who can teach me by paying attention to. He also uh, introduced me to Jenny Levines, who's a school librarian in suburban Chicago. Uh, one day, uh, Miguel Buell, who's Director of Instructional Technology in San Antonio, uh, left a comment on one of Will's blogs. And I liked where he was taking what Will, what Will wrote. So here's somebody else I need to be paying attention to. And then, uh, then uh, these two guys left comments on my blog. This is Gary Staber, whose blog is called uh, Staber to Go. This is uh, Dave Jakes, whose blog is called um, Strength of Weak Ties. And Gary Staber disagreed with what I said in my blog. And Gary Steger uh, frequently disagrees <laughs> with what I say in my blog. But, but I don't agree with his disagreement. But the power of his logic 
pushing, pushes me to, to take my own ideas out and turn around and look at them from a different direction. And I'll learn from that. And here's somebody else I need to be paying attention to is Gary Staple. And then, and then this guy right here, I pay attention to him because he pays attention to everybody else. That's Stephen Downs, and he probably spends 26 hours a day reading other people's blogs. And, and I mean, I happen to know he spends about an hour a day reading people's blogs, and he will write maybe four, maybe eight, maybe 14 blogs a day, typically one, maybe two short paragraphs where he says, I just read this, this person's saying this, this is what I think about it, and, and there's a link down at the bottom to it. He's what we call a filter. He, uh, 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 he, he reads all these other blogs, and the things that look like that would be valuable to other people, he forwards them into his blogs. So through him, we're reading thousands of other uh, ideas out there. And, and, and as I, I continue to, to go through this process, I came to realize that, that this, is, this is learning today. This is about personal learning. Uh, it's personal learning environments. Sometimes it's called personal learning networks. But it is, it is professional educators who are connecting themselves to people and sources out there who have things to say to help us do our jobs. And to be teaching today, to be an educator today in the 21st century, we need to be doing this. We need to be connected. Nothing new about this. This is, uh, you know, uh, when I was um, teaching back before the internet, uh, I had a personal learning network. It was the teacher who taught over there, and I had that room right over there. This teacher who taught in this room over here. It was a school librarian. It was a small professional library that she maintained. Okay? There's, there's nothing new about this. It's just that that, that network was a sneaker network. The information, the ideas I had access to were, were ideas that I could walk to in my sneakers. The information environment has changed. The windows that we have on content has changed in some very, very powerful ways. We can actually control those windows to help us learn, to create networks of connections to people who help us learn. So, what I'd like for you to do is uh, think for just about a half a minute about something that you have learned, something that you have learned here at this conference that you're going to take back with you, that you're going to keep thinking about, that's wrinkled your brain. That's it. Think about something that has wrinkled your brain. Okay, I was hoping for a little better than that. I thank you very, very much. What happened? What about you just stood up and took a picture? Why'd you do that? <laughs> okay, how many of you got that tweet? Okay, the, the idea was uh, when, when, the, uh, when the picture of the camera came up and I said, now, if you happen to have a digital camera or whatever, stand up and take a picture of people around you as you're thinking about something that you just learned. You know, it's, it's, it, it, through this connection, we were able to cultivate an event. Thank you very, very much. Thank you back there uh, in the back. Email those, uh, all of those pictures to Chris Smith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Linda Darling Hammond. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Linda Dar Darling Hammond? She, she is held in very, very high esteem in my country. She, she may be right now the most respected educator in, in, in my country. She's a professor of education at Stanford University. She was uh, Obama's um, uh, top aide on education during his campaign. Uh, we are still uh, hurting, hurting very, very badly by the fact that he was not able to convince her to be the Secretary of Education. It would be a whole different situation there right now if she had been named the Secretary of Education. But uh, uh, she has written a book called uh, something like uh, What We Know About Education. And, and, and I take these three ideas with me everywhere. Three things that we know through research. Three things that we know that help people learn. And, and I want to share those three with you. And, uh, uh, and I've, 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 par I've uh, paraphrased them with sort of my own, my own flavors. But number one is that we learn when we are invited to connect new learning uh, with knowledge, skills, and experience that we already that's already a part of us. We learn when we can connect things with what we already know. We learn when we are challenged to use our learning to make something that we didn't know that we could make. We didn't believe that we could make. We learn well when we use what we learn to make something we didn't know that we could make. And we learn very, very well when we are given uh, an audience uh, for telling the story of how we learn. You know, if we're if 
we're meddling or thinking and then turning that thinking into a story. We learn very, very well. Um, I'm, I'm close to the end. This was the beginning for me. This was the computer that seduced me. <laughs> I was taking a uh, class, a recertification class, at Wingate College in North Carolina. It was a uh, uh, diagnostic prescriptive reading and writing class. Uh, the professor's name was Dr. Funderburg, and she, he had a learning lab in Monroe. The parents would bring their children to and pay a fee, and, and he would uh, he had all these diagnostic tools, and he'd help them learn to read better and do math better and things like that. So for one of the class periods, he had his meet, meeting at this learning lab, and he was then taking us on a tour, showing all the instruments that he uses and so on. We walked in, and I saw this thing right here sitting in the corner. That's the first time I had seen a computer before, a, a personal computer before. Uh, I had seen them in Radio Shack magazines, but I had no idea what it was. I had no idea of what you might do with one, but this is the first one that I see uh, face to face. So he takes us on the tour, he takes us all around, and then he dismisses us without saying anything about the computer. Dr. Funderburg, what about that computer back there? How, 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 how do you use that? He said, I'm glad you, you reminded me. And he took us over and he set me down at that computer. And he reached over and he turned it on. I had no idea what was going to happen. For all I knew, lights would start flashing on the screen as soon as he turned it on. And he turned that thing on and after about a, a half a second, up in the upper left hand corner, it said, ready. <laughs> and I fell out of my seat. Because this machine was talking to me. This machine was telling me that it was ready. And then he reached over and he typed in low math C drive. Or C low math, that's what he typed in. And, and immediately this little cassette player over on the right started whirring. And it was loading that math program. It took about six minutes. And load that map program into the computer. And then it put a menu up there. He said, that's a menu. And it said, you know, uh, addition problems, press A. Uh, subtraction problems, press B. Multiplication problems, press C. And I gotta, I gotta climb back up off the floor again. This is a machine that's telling me how to operate it. It's a conversation I'm having with the machine to operate it. And I typed in, you know, I, I hit long division. And I worked through a long division problem. And when I finished it, I hit the final uh, ready. It, 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 uh, for about 90 seconds, pixel by pixel, it made a picture of a smiling face. And I was blown away. And I did another, and that time I typed in the wrong answer. And pixel by pixel, for about 90 seconds, it made a frowning face, which was even more exciting. <laughs> and I was sold. I was seduced. This is the future. Because we've got a machine that we operate by communicating with the machine. And I, and I, I took this, this uh, passion back to school, talked to the principal, and, and somehow that summer, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody wrote a grant and, and got 11 uh, Radio Shack computers for two of the middle schools. And my school got one of them. And, and since none of the other teachers in my school uh, had any interest in them. I got all 11 of those computers in my classroom. I had an 11 uh, computer lab in my classroom in 1982. This is what we had. Radio Shack Model 3s. 16 kilobytes of memory. These things were hot. No software. That wasn't part of the grant. No software. Back then we just thought that the green glow off of those cat those ray tubes washing over our children's faces was going to make them smarter. So I had to teach myself how to program these computers so my students would have something to do with it. One of the first programs I wrote was called Stock Bearing. And it was, a, it was like a stock market simulation. Where the student would come in, they would start the first month, and he gave them a list of about 10 companies that could buy stock in. And, and then it would present them with the Wall Street Review, which included three stories that I planted. And each of those stories was, was, was logically set up to have either a positive or a negative effect on one of, the, uh, one of the companies that had an option to buy or sell stock in. So they would read the story and decide what they were going to buy or sell. And then they go to the next month and they tell them how much money they had made and how much money they had lost. Now this, this, this worked great, the kids loved it, but there was, a, there was a, a group of kids, about five boys, called themselves the stock bearers. 
They started making millions and millions and millions of dollars in one six month play. I'd get on at the end of the day and I'd play it and I could only make about $400,000. I know the Cubs. I should be getting the perfect score. They're making millions and millions of dollars. How are y'all doing that? Oh, Mr. Warlock, it's just shrewd business finance knowledge. We know how this works, you don't. So this went on for a couple of weeks. These kids are making millions of dollars and I, I, you know, I, I can't figure out what they're doing until finally one of those boys waited until after school, waited until the hall's clear, walked into my classroom and said, Mr. Warlock, I need to explain to you. How we're doing that. He said, We discovered a bug in your program. <laughs> I told him what a bug was. This is a bug in your program. You see. He, he said, You know, under these conditions, we learned that we can sell more stock than we own. <laughs> so that night, I hauled one of those computers home with me, took up the whole back seat of the, the car, <laughs> and I worked on the code. Brought it back the next day, loaded the code on the other computers. First period, I'm teaching history, and here come the stock parents. They've all got to study all at the same time. They come marching out. I remember one particular boy, Her, Her, Pearson Duval. Pearson Duval, he comes, he comes strutting into my classroom. He goes over to his favorite computer. He sits down, and he starts typing, he starts playing, and I'm keeping an eye on him. I'm continuing to teach my students, but I'm keeping an eye on Pearson Duval. I don't like Pearson Duvall. <laughs> so I'm watching him, and that, that perpetual look of cockiness that he carries with him all the time turns into concern. And then that concern turns into downright worry. And he finally hesitantly raises his hand and says, Mr. Warlick, what does embezzlement mean? <laughs> Why did I just get fined $2 million? I will never forget the day that I got Pearson Duvall. <laughs> but the most important thing that I will never forget about that experience is not that I got Pearson Duvall. It is that I discovered that day that the power of this machine is not that it's a machine that you operate by communicating with. It is that it is a machine that we can communicate with each other in powerful ways. It's not this machine you copy communicate with and it is providing us with brand new ways to communicate with each other in powerful transformative ways and it can even happen when you're alive. In closing, I want to share with you one more web page. This is important because one of these nights you're going to be surfing the internet and you're going to find yourselves at the end. When you reach the end of the internet this is what you'll see. That's the web page at the end of the internet. It says you have reached the end of the internet. You will have to turn around. Use your browser's back button to do so. This is the final directory entry of the easternmost web server located in the city of St. John's, Newfoundland. The internet's by route junction codes North America all have been going down more than limbs number and more than one except for Newfoundland because Newfoundland is at the end. There's all kinds of neat things you learn about Newfoundland on the internet but not here because you've reached the end. Folks, we've reached the end of this conference, but y'all have many more opportunities to learn about modernizing our classrooms, about uh, creating learning experiences that are relevant for our children, for their future, a future we cannot clearly describe. You've made new friends here. You're going to continue conversations. You're going to continue to ask questions. You're going to grow your personal learning networks. You have many more opportunities to learn, but not here, because we reached the end of this presentation. <laughs> Thank you all.